Welcome everyone uh, this evening. And um, after the last um, chapter of the book, I want to see God we consider the last time. We are entering into the second volume of the book. We've journeyed thus far and we ended that first book with the understanding of faith. Because what we guide us on the second part of this work is only faith. We've spoken so much about what Blessed Marie Eugene will call the universal path or the universal help that we get on our spiritual path. But now we are entering into that particular grace that God offers. And it is entering into on the dark night. Sometimes we may think of the dark night as a difficult thing, a difficult experience, but the dark night is actually not a deprivation of light or a privation of light, no. The dark night is the explosion or the, the, the fullness of light manifesting itself to us even in our own littleness or nothingness, as we may want to call it. So, but what we are entering into today is the book, I am a daughter of the church. Those were the words of St. Teresa of Avila on a dying bed. I die a daughter of the church. And it's also something Therese would would exclaim when she discovered a vocation. In the heart of the church, I shall be loved. And so, but to enter into this book, it may seem fitting to start from the beginning of the book. But recent studies, especially on biblical uh, aspects, we've seen that the authors who wrote the gospels actually began from the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which are the last part of the gospels. So they, they journeyed from that experience back to the life of Christ and to his birth. And many scholastics, especially in the 12th century, they began imploring such method to speak Thomas Aquinas will often place the conclusion of what he wants to say first and walk towards it. And scholars, scholarly work on St. Teresa of Avila has shown that it is important to read the last chapter of the book, Interior Castle, the seventh mansion actually, to understand the first to the sixth mansion. It's quite strange for someone to pick up a book and to read the last chapter of the book. But to understand actually Theresa's work on the interior castle is first to read the seventh mansion without reading the first mansion, without reading the introduction, just read the seventh mansion. Therein holds the key to unpacking what Theresa wants to say because there Theresa discusses puts together in summary all what she was going to say from the first to the sixth mansion. And you know what to look at for. So that is the same approach we'll be going through today with this book. We're going to the last chapter of the book. And the last chapter of the book is the saint in the whole Christ. Because in that chapter, it's where, in my opinion, Blessed Marie Eugene brings together the three doctors of Carmel, Theresa, John, and Therese. From the first chapter of the book, I Want to See God, he said that his goal is to bring these three doctrines together. However, Theresa was the dominant figure in in the first part of the work, I want to see God. 
John will become dominant in the second book. But at this, in this last chapter, he brings the three together in harmony. It's quite difficult to bring three different individuals with three different paths, with three different approach to God together in harmony. And that is the beauty of this book and the beauty of this chapter. There is a summary. I think it was um, Simon Wells who defines beauty. He said beauty is the harmony of dissimilar things. Things that are not the same, things that don't look alike, but to put them together in harmony expresses beauty. And this is the beauty we encounter in this chapter. Therese had an approach to God. Teresa, the same. John, a different one. And so, but what unites them is the goal of the journey. They all took different paths, but they arrived at the same point. Transforming union, John of the Cross would call it. Transforming union that brings freedom. Teresa would not use the term freedom. Teresa calls it a transformation. A transformation that brings forth true life. If you pick the, the, the image of the butterfly, how it comes, it is when in the cocoon, once the butterfly comes out, there's a transformation. There is new life. There is a new discovery of itself. But Therese will call that experience a transforming love. It, it is that height of perfection is the height of love. It is where love is purified. Love is refined. Love takes a new meaning. Love takes a new understanding. So with these different terms that they put, they all used to describe one reality, Blessed Marie Eugene was able to put them side by side to bring out, in fact, in this chapter is the synthesis of Carmelite spirituality. If you like, the pillars of Carmelite spirituality expressed before Teresa. What Teresa did was to explain through her own experience the gift of Carmel. But what we find here in this chapter, and indeed in this book, I am a daughter of the church, is how God brings us to that experience of transformation, to use the term of Teresa, transforming union, to use the term of John, or transformation of love, to use Therese. How God journeys with the human person. It is only the light of faith that can guide us from now on. It's like what Thomas Aquinas will say, where the senses cannot go, faith leads us. Faith leads us where the senses can no longer walk. And where we are entering, the realm we are entering, in, entering into, it is the realm of faith. When we describe it as the dark night, it is because our senses may not be very useful in perceiving outrightly the graciousness and manifestations of God. Rather, the inner senses, if you like, the inner senses are awakened to the promptings of God. External senses only serves when the soul gets to that point of union 
and has to journey back. But this is what we'll be discussing today. The experience of God is actually the same. But for Blessed Marie Eugene in this chapter, he says that the language and the path are different. They are unique to each person. So this is foundation of the Carmelite spirituality. The path that God leads us is unique. Each person. There are no two with the same path. But he found a common denominator. He found something common to the three of them that he can hold together. He found, if you like, a cord to tie the three together. And this, what he found, what he discovered, there are two words there, love and mission, or love and apostolate. Those are two key words that expresses the goal of the Christian life, the goal of the spiritual life, explained by Teresa, John, Therese in different ways, but what binds them together are those two words. So I would like to stay with these two terms to explain or to reflect with you, not really to explain uh, what Blessed Marie Eugene is offering us in this chapter on this beautiful day of his feast. And so we shall consider first the understanding of this love in its language, love as a language, but also as a movement. Two things to, this, to, this, to reflect on in this um, first part. And then the invitation to, to embrace mission. The invitation for mission. I hope we can we can uh, do justice to these uh, two terms. It's quite a very long chapter, but uh, we can just summarize it in this form. So we look at the first part. I call it a double impact. A double impact is what Blessed Marie Eugene would describe as the two-fold movement of love. Because for him, the language of the spiritual life is love. If we must understand, because often I'll, someone said to me, Father, how do I know that God is speaking to me? When I try to listen to God, I only end up hearing myself. How do I know God is speaking? That's a very important question. Well, the point is that the, the, the sisters seem to be searching to hear God in human language. There is a mode of communication and those, that mode, those modes of communication is what we find in virtually many of the chapters of this second book. How God communicates is language. It's a language that we ought to learn. It is called the language of love, the divine language. But that's not what we are about this, this evening. It lays the foundation here, even though it's a conclusion of the book. The language of the spiritual life is love, and that love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, drawing from St. Paul's experience. And this love that is poured into our hearts makes us children of God. So love gives us something that I often like referring to in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It gives us a filial boldness. I like that expression, a filial boldness to call God Father. We wouldn't dare to call him Father because if it were in our state of sin, we say we are only slaves. But there is a filial boldness to call him Father. Abba. What Blessed Marie Eugene is insisting on at the first part is that love was first given. 
love was first given. It is something that is poured into us. And the experience of deep contemplative prayer, what prayer does is to return love that was given. Love in return for love. This is the experience of contemplation. It's simply love in return for love. And so the first movement of this love is from God. The first direction of this movement is from God. God is always the initiator of this process. He takes the first step. For us to want to pray, it is because God has invited us to do so. For us to want to experience love, it is a response of the love that we have received. It's what John of the Cross would describe by that famous uh, um, poem, One Dark Night, Fired by Love's Urgent London. Ah, the sheer grace, I went out on sin, my house being now all still. The heart is fired by love. And what does the soul do? The soul, the human person, goes in search of the beloved. But John would say that what happens is that it is the beloved that goes in search of the human person. It's like, the, it, I, I'll compare it to the experience of St. Augustine. When St. Augustine speaks of searching for God outside of himself, whereas God was within calling him, searching for him. God was actually the one searching for him. And this is what love does. The first movement of this law touches on the fact that God is the first principle, is the principal actor of this experience. He is the one that invites the human person. The fire of love was ignited by God so that the soul can make this journey so that the soul can move this movement. It, it is moving on a thread of love, on that language of love. So that the soul might return love for love. It is a simple experience. Teresa describes it beautiful, one of her experiences. She came in and saw a little child on the steps. And the little child inquired from her, what is your name? Oh, my name is Teresa of Jesus. And she said to the child, what is your name? He said, I am Jesus of Teresa. The experience of that is to communicate something. If you are Teresa of Jesus, if you have experienced that love, then it is returned. You give love for love. You give love to receive love. Love is offered to get love in return. So Blessed Marie Eugene writes, he said, to return to its divine source, it's a primary focus actually, such is the desire of filial love. To enter into it more profoundly and be lost in its depths, this is the wages of the loving soul. Its recompense is a greater love, a closer union with his God. Just to unpack this a little. In returning love for love, the soul finds itself soaked, if you like, plunged into the very depths of God's love. 
And what does it find in the very depth of God's love? It is love. It finds love there. It's reward. Blessed Marie Eugene is drawing from the, uh, the, the experience of John of the Cross. The reward that is so gets in entering this love is love. Here we are using love, 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 but they don't just all say the same thing at the same time. Love that is given, ignited in the soul, it's the pure divine love. And what the soul gives in return, it's also through human love enveloped in the divine. And so the human person plunges into the very love of God, goes into the depth of that love. And what does he draw out from it? The experience, divine love. It transforms, if you like, human experience of love. The limitation of human love, if you want to put it that way. Of course, Blessed Marie Eugene encourages or discourages us from making so much distinctions. Because if you try making too much distinctions, you put too many things in opposition and you may not go far in explaining them. But what we are explaining it's something that is that beats human terms and human language. Teresa struggled to explain this in the book of her life. She struggled, but she could not just explain this experience explicitly. Not until she did so in the interior castle, especially in the sixth dimension. It's one knack of Teresa's work that shows the matured, as we refer to her, the mature Teresa speaking. Because human language fails us when we come to this experience. The experience, it's in a different language. It's in a divine language. And so if you are told to explain a divine language, a divine communication in human terms, Human terms fall short of all the sides to this language. So this is the soul desire. Love is the soul desire of one who has experienced the love of God. The love that is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And what makes it more interesting is that those who desire this love, they live all their lives savoring the sweetness of this love, enjoying the sweetness of this love. Because once experienced, we will never let it go. Once we experience true love, the love of God, it's never gone. It's never taken away. And Therese will explain this when she said, oh, it is love. To love and to be loved and to return to earth to make love to be loved. There, love is not referred to a thing. Love is referred to a person. Love is not just something, but it is someone. Oh, love, it is love. To love and to be loved and to return to earth to make love to be loved. This is our mission. She said to herself, my mission is about to begin. My mission is to love, is to make others love God as much as I love him. Her little way is to make others love God. For her, the height of perfection is the perfection of this love. Where love is not something external to myself, I become love itself. I live in love. And love becomes part of my existence. And that is why Blessed Marie Eugene would we add this, that 
For the loving soul who possesses God here on earth in the darkness of faith, the perfect fulfillment is to possess him in the beatific vision, for this is everlasting life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and him that you have sent, Jesus Christ. To possess God, it is, it is possible this is the first truth we can find on this reality, to possess God here on earth. To possess God is, is, not to, is not only to have God, it is to be in God, to be completely enveloped in God, is to possess him. And the soul never lets him go. Once experienced, it is the soul stays without experience. And here we notice the double impact of this love. The love of God to the soul and the love response of the soul to God. We're not speaking of two different love here. It is the love of God and the love response of the soul to this same love. Reading Blessed Marie, Eugene, especially in this chapter, we may be tempted to think that what he's emphasizing is the movement of the soul to God. It is actually the movement of God to the soul. The first movement of love is that of the is, is, is the movement from God to the soul. The impact it makes is that the soul returns this love. This is important to understand the very meaning of transforming union, of transformation, or of transforming love. Because in God, the human person does not lose itself. This is something very, very important. We do not lose our humanness, if you like, when we come to that experience of transformation. Because there are many philosophies that tend to speak of the soul being absorbed in God or being, you know, um, being, how would I put it, being, the soul disappears, if you like. I don't want to use the term disappears. That the human person, it loses its nature because now it is one with God. No. The human person remains human. But his experience, the life he lives, is a life all that inspired by love and order by love. It is an experience that does not take away my human nature. Just like Christ, taking off the human nature didn't take away his divinity. His divine nature and his human nature lived in the same person. And theology will tell us that there was no confusion, there was no mixing, there was no division, there was no absorption, like Eutychus will propose, that the human nature is absorbed in the divine nature, that the human nature no longer exists. No. So it is with our experience, a human nature remains, but we share the very the divine life of God. And so Blessed Marie Eugene right? this is beautiful when it said, confirmed in God by transforming the union, he is nevertheless the man and saint of a particular epoch, of a people of a very definite age of the mystical body of Christ 
in its growth. It doesn't take away the times, the struggles of the time that this person lived. It doesn't take the other way. But it brings one to that experience in a renewed understanding and a renewed experience. So the, the experience of transformation prompted by our love response and return for love received, our life and actions are rooted in the experience of a loving God. It introduces the soul to the life offered by the spirit of love. It brings us to the very life, how Christ, how God himself relates to, to them, how God relates. The life of the Blessed Trinity is a, is a relational life. It's a life of relationship. And bringing us into that experience is for us to build an understanding of what relationship means. This is what happens to the soul. He says, in the measure that charity walks in us, a transformation of love, it surrenders us to the spirit of love. And when this transformation is complete, all our movements, all our aspirations are regulated and ordered by love. To surrender to love is the invitation to return love for love. And when the human person has accepted to return this love for love, what happens? The movement of the human person, the aspirations of the human person, the very life of the human person is now regulated and ordered by love. Love, yeah, is not a sentiment, it's not something that is offered, it's a person. Is not regulated and ordered by the Spirit of God, who is love. We refer to the Spirit of God as the bond of love between the Father and the Son. He regulates and orders our journey. So here lies the second movement. The first movement is that of God to the soul. The second movement is not the soul returning love for love because that is one movement with an impact, but it is the soul moving to the other. John of the Cross says that when the soul reaches divine union, it doesn't remain there. From that experience of transformation, the soul is sent back to the external world. And in the seventh mansion, Teresa will describe that as, oh, the power of spiritual marriage is not for your enjoyment systems. It is for good works. It is to produce good works. And so the experience of divine union does not isolate the human person from the world. It is not an experience that closes the human person to the world. If, this is the, if that is the case, then what happened to the soul is not transformation. It not, is not transforming union. It is not the perfection of love. What happened to the soul is that it encountered its ego. It creates a divine image of its ego and cause that is God. So what John of the Cross will describe by this will say that when transformation happens, the ego is transformed to become an icon and not an idol. When the soul, when the human person 
encounters itself a it creates of its ego an idol, an idol to be worshipped. But rather, what happens in transforming union is that the ego is transformed to become an icon. An icon is a reflection of the image of God right there in the center of the soul. So here, the second movement, it's really very important to hold on to. It is a movement that reaches out to the other. To see a truly holy person, someone who has experienced union with God, it is someone who has not destroyed its ego, because sometimes we may speak of the ego as something that ought to be destroyed. No, what John of the Cross speaks of is that the ego needs to be given its own place within. Often it takes the center stage where God ought to be, where his majesty sits, to use the term of Teresa. And so in the experience of union, John will say that it is good to displace the ego and replace the ego, the position of, that the ego had taken before with God, because that is the rightful position of God. And so what the ego does is that it reflects, the ego stays there, it reflects the very image of God. And that is why the ego becomes an icon. Those we celebrate as saints, we celebrate them because they reflected something of God. Their ego have become icons for us. Many have lived where their ego are simply idols that they worship. And this is why Blessed Marie Eugene, just getting a quote, he said, transforming the union by introducing the soul into God does not isolate it from the world. That's the first thing. If your spirituality closes you to the world, then it, it is called into question. Such union associates the soul with the intense life of the church, with the mission of the church. What is the very, what the mission of the church is to reach out. It is to offer, it is not just to preach words. What we preach is life itself. It's a reflection. And so he says that the more the saints are held captive by love, the nearer they are to us. The more they are held in that experience of union, the closer they are to their neighbor. For in divinizing them, this is the experience, divinization is another term to speak of transformation. In the, in the Eastern Rite, it is, it's a common word that is used, deification and divinization. Of course, in the Western world, to speak of divinization is like creating a deity. But here we're speaking of transform. In transforming them, charity causes them to enter into the depths of sin, the great suffering of humanity. Charity brings them to help those wallowing in darkness and in the shadow of death to an experience of the bright light that they have experienced themselves. And doesn't Marie Eugene conclude that if it were otherwise, it would not be true that they are identified with Christ. If we cannot feel the suffering, if we cannot enter into the suffering of others,
then the experience of union is called into question. So the movement to the other has as a source the love of God. And that is why John of the Cross would say that wonderful and beautiful quote that in the evening of our life, we shall be judged on love. Love is the measure. Love is the criteria for judgment. We shall be judged. Love is not just what we do. It should be who we are. So that the degree of our love may be taken as the degree of our glory and our capacity for the beatific vision. The measure of our love becomes the measure of the beauty and dignity that the beatific vision will give. So we see that love is the language here. Reading this text, you, 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 you can't just count the number of times love was mentioned. Well, I think I've taken too much time on this first part. I hope we'll have time for the second part. But one thing there is that there is no need to put in opposition human love and divine love. But what happens to our human love is that it is transformed. When life is not regulated and ordered by the spirit of love, our human love is transformed and it becomes different. Its expression is different. I wouldn't love you because of what I would get in return from you. That would be like investing you invest to get something in return. Love first is sacrificial. It doesn't wait for something in return, but if he gets it, it's beautiful. So we cannot speak of love of God without speaking of love of the neighbor. When Jesus said there, is, there are only two commandments or the commandments can be summarized in two, love of God, and I like the term that Matthew or Mark uses. He said, the second resembles it. The second is similar to it. It's the love of neighbor. And Blessed Marie Eugene will say, how can the saint transformed by love and identified with Christ not bear with him these riches characteristic of divine love? How can we limit a soul that is transformed by love to just human love? It is not possible. Because at that moment, it is enveloped in love. It is lived for love. It, its existence is love. Because it is now ordered by love. Let's quickly rush up to the second part. Sorry, I'm taking too much time on this first part. Now the second part. is that this second movement of love contains within it our vocation. Because in our vocation, we find our mission. So I'm thinking the other term, mission, which is an invitation, which is an invitation. I thought Marie Eugene would say that the perfect accomplishment of one's mission is the great proof of love that God requires of those upon whom he has conferred it. The fulfillment of our mission is reaching out to the other. It is to express that love that we ourselves have received. Here, speaking about mission, Blessed Marie Eugene will bring out the beautiful expression of Therese of the child Jesus. 
And he uses that to explain our mission or the apostolate that we, we ought to engage in in the seventh man, in the seven mansions of St. Teresa, which I would not want to go into because of time, but still with St. Teresa here. The first thing that comes to mind when we speak about mission, it's about going somewhere. Oh, I'm going on a mission. But one thing that Therese taught the church was that mission was not about going somewhere. Mission has a deep contemplative experience. How did she teach the church this? Because that's the reason why the church made her patroness of the mission. Together with great Francis Xavier, who had no time even to rest because of baptizing and, and, and teaching catechesis when he traveled on mission. But Therese never left the monastery, yet she's the, matron, she's the patroness of the mission. What did she teach the church? It is that the term mission, which is which is a Latin connotation, takes out two other aspects that is part of the term mission. The Hebrew term to describe the idea of mission will be malach. Malach is a term used for a messenger or an angel. And then what, where is the emphasis? The emphasis often, oh, the angel of the Lord appeared to this person. The angel of the Lord. The emphasis is on the angel and the message that he communicates. The emphasis is on the one that is, that is sent. Because in, in mission, in the term mission, there are three aspects to it. It means that someone is sending, there is the one that is sent, and there are those to whom the messenger was sent. But the Hebrew word keeps the emphasis on the one that is sent. So what the Greeks would do is to divide this term in two. Angelos, which will be an angel, and Apostolos, which will be an apostle. An apostle is the one that is being sent out. But the emphasis here is on the one sending. Mark will tell us that Jesus called 12 and he named them apostles. The emphasis is on the one sending, it's on Jesus that is sending. But in the Latin world, we find three terms. Angelorum, which will be angel, apostolorum, and missionum. Missionum now puts the emphasis on the people to whom the message was sent. And so for a long time, we've stayed just with the people. But the rest is no that the idea of mission carries within it the power and the experience of the one sending, the lived witness and response of love of the one being sent. And the movement of the one being sent to the other. The emphasis is not just onto the other, but there is a process that in some way it started from. And this is the beautiful thing that Therese brings and offers the church. And she's patroness of the missions. She never left the monastery, but she is patroness of the missions. And Therese sees something really important that the experience, our apostolate, what we do, how we express this love, 
ought to come from that deep experience from God. And one thing Blessed Marie Eugene will insist on, I would like to conclude here, we don't want to go further on this, is that, is that of faithfulness to that gift, fidelity to that gift, the gift that has been entrusted to us. To be faithful to the gift we have received is to be faithful to our mission. And for every of the mansions, there's a particular mission or apostolate that is being required of the human person. But, faith, but, but what exactly is this faithfulness? Blessed Marie Eugene says that faithfulness, this faithfulness consists in collaboration with the action of the Holy Spirit, who is building up the church. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of love, who builds with love. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of love, who builds with love. His action is love. His existence is love. And this is the invitation that we've got. This is the invitation to us. And towards the last part of that book, Blessed Marie Eugene writes, I would like to conclude with this quote, which is really beautiful. It says that the delicate charms of this loved collaboration of God and the soul, these planes of the love that unite them, I love that term, the planes of this love, how it interplays, how it relates, in turn, brilliant and hidden, all these splendors of loneliness, of loneliness and of power are only beauties of here below, a reflection that reaches us from, this is the beauty of it, the expression of this beauty reaches us from the beauty of the work the Holy Spirit is building. What we reflect should be the love that we have experienced. And John of the Cross would say, where there is no love, put love, and there you will find love. Because the gift that we have received, it is that of love. Love that must be received, lived, and shared. Thank you. Just to give us an idea of what this book is going to offer us during this uh, our course of our reflection. We've seen the last chapter. So it will be a matter of journeying back, which will be a wonderful experience. Thank you.